Everyone may be seated. Thank you. Mr. Matea, is, the, is there a need? Would we need to mark this for purposes of the record? What you want to wish you to present, or just want me to take notice of it? Yeah, the, the PowerPoint is just purely there for you to use. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to see things on the screen. Okay. And if you want to take notes on it, you can take notes on it. The thing that's on top of it, though, is something that we're going to ask to be introduced as an exhibit. Uh, All right. And it's, I don't know that it's going to be a dispute, but it's a copy of the ADDW that was filed by Maori Capital. And it's mentioned in the brief. Can we take it up now or later? So, well, Your Honor, before, please, I think when it comes to the record, sometimes less is not more. Okay. The budget is the budget. Anything that will be introduced today for the board's benefit would you like Mark to make a part of the record? Okay. I, I agree. I think that would I think that would make the record much clearer. Yeah, no, so uh, proceed at your proceed at your it's on your terms. And your honor, I may take you up on your offer to kind of if I can go up here because I think it'd be easier to go on the PowerPoint. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how it's gonna impact you guys. I'm gonna try to see like right or so. Okay, so your honor, what we got in front of us is basically all the very securities, securities fraud focused motions and rates, okay? The very first one that we're gonna take up is the first application for an habeas corpus. This is on the failure to register account. And, you know, I wanna encourage any questions that you might have as we go through this, Your Honor. So, let's, let's kind of go through just a quick summary of what we've got in the first grid. In the very first grid, General Paxson makes the argument that the failure to register statute criminalizes only the failure to register and not the failure to notice file. And the difference between notice file and registration is like night and day in this case. Paxson was only required to notice file, and that's because the investment advisor that is alleged that he worked for, or at least we believe is alleged, is Maori Capital Management. Maori was federally covered on the date charged in the this writ of habeas corpus, we believe, must issue because no person who need only notice file, including Paxson, may be indicted for such a crime, meaning the failure to register as we did the first point. Now, the state's reply, I'm going to go into a lot more detail, so, but it's basically based on judicial estoppel that there's a very specific statement that is made in the disciplinary order in front of the Texas State Securities Board, which is, does not seemingly uh, contest that, well, I'm sorry, that uh, Maori, Maori transitioned back to state regulation and is currently registered as an investment advisor with the Texas State Securities Board. That is the basis for their judicial stop. I'll tell you why judicial stop doesn't apply, one, and two, why it's not inconsistent with our, our stance here. And so let's go to the very first kind of the nuts and bolts. This is the criminal statute that's in play in this case, 29. Any person who shall render services as an investment advisor or an investment advisor representative without being registered as required by this act. Now, first off, let's note without being registered. So it talks about registration. And then this is kind of like a preview, Your Honor, because we're going to talk about this a little later, as required by this act. And this is going to come up not only in connection with our motion to quash, but kind of the do-over that the state is asking for today on the motion for leave to amend. Okay. The next statute that's in play is the TSA, what I mean by that is the, the Texas Securities Act, Section 12, and note the title of it, Registration of Persons Selling Securities or Rendering Investment Advice. Okay. This is the registration statute. Now, the first part we don't have to worry about because that talks about investment advisors. It's alleged that General Paxson was an investment advisor representative. Okay. So, what we do is we go down here. It says a person may not act or render services as an investment advisor representative for a certain investment advisor in the state unless the person is registered or submits a notice filing. 
when we talked about the night and day between notice filing and registration, it's even noted in Section 12. And importantly, as an investment advisor representative for that particular investment advisor, as provided in Section 18 or 12-1, 12-1 is a key statute, and it's the next one that we've got right here. Because the Texas Securities Act, it's set up a means by which that if an investment advisor is federally covered, meaning that if they're registered with the SEC, then they don't need to be regulated by the state. They're regulated by the feds. But, I mean, the truth is, is that the state wants to get basically a revenue collection statute because they want people to not only notice file if they're federally registered, but they also want a fee, and it's not an insubstantial fee. So 12-1 is basically the state saying that, okay, if we recognize that people that are federal covered, they don't need regulation by us, but we certainly want to make sure we know that they're there, and more importantly, is we want to get a fee. Okay. So investment advisor representatives only need notice file if the investment advisor is federally covered. Now federally covered, just so we go through everything, means an investment advisor that is registered under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. We're actually going to talk a little bit later about the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. This is all shorthand for if you register with the SEC, then you're federal covered. Okay. <clears throat> so how do you register with the SEC? Forget the state. Let's talk about being federally covered. Well, the way you do it is you go to the Investor Advisor Registration Depository. This is the basically a screen print from the website. So if you were to go there right now, you can go there. Anybody here in the audience can go there. And you can pull up various investment advisors to look into their registration status. If you were to go there right now and to look at the Mowry Capital Register, you would actually see that they're state registered because they did, in fact, state register. And that was accepted by the state on June the 25th of 2012. But if you were to go back there, for example, you know, back when they were federally registered, okay, you would see that they were federally registered as well. You can get an entire snapshot of what their registration status is by doing that. So let's take a look at it. And the difference between state registration and federal registration depends upon the amount of money that's involved? You know, it, it does. Okay. It does. And, and the way that works, John, is that back in 1996, there's a statute we're going to talk about later when we talk about the second rate, but let's talk about it right now because this is a good question. It's called NISMI. And NISMI was a sea change in the world of securities world. Because what NISMIA did was basically say, we're going to federally preempt lots of things that the states have been doing because the states are doing things in all sorts of different ways and it's impossible for investment advisors, which is part of our case, to know what it is that they've got to do. Okay? And NISMIA also said that if an investment advisor had assets under management above $25 million that you file with the SEC, Okay. Now, I don't know when Mowry Capital Management came to be, but kind of during the times in question, they've been at about $35 million in assets under management. So after 1996, when NISMIA was passed, Mowry Capital Management, when they had assets under management that were over 25, we had to federally register. And in fact, they did, 2008. And we know that because if we go to the IARD website, we see that the SEC approved the registration for Maori Capital Management on October 15, 2008. Okay. And we also see, and this is again from the website, that the SEC terminated their registration status on October the 11th, 2012. Now the date is in the indictment, it's July 2012. So they were federally covered at the time alleged in the indictment. Now, the next document that is important for the court to acknowledge
is the document that gets filed, Your Honor, to withdraw from federal registration. And the document that gets filed by, that's filed by Mallory with the SEC on the IARD website is this document right here. So it's an ADVW, so that means that they're withdrawing, that's what the W stands for. And it's filed on 10-11-2012. Now that date corresponds to the date that we just saw, okay? And as a result, because they notice a withdrawal, the SEC terminates their registration and they are no longer federally covered. So the document that has already been marked as exhibit number one, as I understand it, is now admitted. That is a certified copy of the ADVW that we received from the SEC. All right, let's get that actually marked. Okay. Would there be any objections for this being admitted for purposes of this hearing? No, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, I have the actual certified copy. Okay. And so for purposes of the record, how is that designated, Mr. Mattei, the exhibit? It's a defendant's exhibit number one. Okay. It's admitted. Go ahead. Okay. So what we see in the very next slide is just, it's just the cover, basically. I took a screenshot of it. And so it reflects that Mallory was registered with the SEC until October the 11th of 2012. So as a result of all of this, Your Honor, we know that the SEC approved Mallory's registration in 2008. It was registered until October the 11th. I believe it is undisputed that Mallory was federally covered through October 11th, 2012. And therefore, Paxson did not need to register while Mallory was federally registered. So let's, you know, don't, don't just take my word for it. When the Rangers went out to talk to Ronak Patel, he's the Deputy State Securities Commissioner for the Texas State Securities Board. And we have the audio from that conversation because it was part of the discovery. And we actually made a transcript of it. It's attached. And I think the court took judicial notice of it earlier. This is the conversation that takes place. So Mr. Patel says, and so now from 2008 until June 25 of 2012, they're SEC registered. During that period, three other clients were referred over by Mr. Paxson to the firm under this arrangement. The ranger says, but that's not anything that you would be regulating at that point. Mr. Patel says, no. The ranger says, he does not have to be registered with you. Patel says, correct. Because of their federal reg, correct. Registration, correct. Okay. They didn't address what happens after June the 25th, but we know. I mean, we know that they were federally covered actually all the way through October the 11th of 2012. You know, not only does Mr. Patel say that, Alan Bromberg, who is a professor over at SMU, who is generally considered one of the leading securities lawyers in the state of Texas, if not the United States. You know, in this article, he wrote about how, in comedy with the federal law, federally registered advisors were allowed to do Texas business with a notice filing in lieu of a registration. And again, that's all because of NISMI. 1996, NISMI was passed. It preempted all sorts of different things that we're going to talk about on the second writ. And if you have assets under management of at least $25 million or more, then you're going to be filing with the SEC. So we've been talking a lot about Mallory's federal registration. Now let's talk a little bit about its state registration. We don't dispute the fact, even though I think the state believes that we do dispute it, that the state accepted Mallory's registration or request to register with the state on June the 25th, 2015. Now the wording, how I worded that, Your Honor, is kind of important because I put in there that the state accepted Mallory's request to register because actually the registration, we don't know exactly because we just haven't had the ability to figure it out quite yet when they actually filed it. But we believe it was filed earlier in 2012. You know, I actually had this date wrong. It's not 2015. It's actually 2012. Okay. I was going to say, wait a minute. Our dates aren't matched. Sorry about that. Okay. My bad. My bad. 
So, and, and the reason why Mallory registered with the state was because it was required to. Remember how we talked about how NISMIA, that, you know, they're required to go federally because the feds want to register them? Well, all of a sudden, remember Dodd-Frank happens after all the collapse, Lehman Brothers and what have you? I mean, Dodd-Frank is a big statute, got lots of stuff. It's got whistleblowing provisions, what have you. But it also, you know, there was a lot of concern about hedge funds. Because hedge funds, it was everybody was worried that they were out there, they were totally unregulated. So basically the feds decide that if they're at a certain level, that they're going to take the hedge funds in addition to investment advisors and everything else that the SEC recognized. But the SEC recognized that there was no way that they could regulate all investment advisors out there if they took on this added burden. So basically what they said was, that if you have assets under management less than $100 million, Mallory had about $35 million at the time, then you need to transition back to the state. That's exactly what Mallory did. So sometime in the first half of 2012, Maori files a request to register with the state. It gets accepted by the state on June 25th of 2012. And Your Honor, I'm just going to flag this, okay? I mean, Maori finds out that the request is accepted because the state lets it know. But you know, General Paxton, I mean, nobody sent a notice out to General Paxton. The referral of the Henry's, which is the basis for the failure to register count, is the next day, on the 26th of June, okay? After June the 25th is when the state actually accepts it. I flagged that because there's just no way on God's green earth that General Paxton could have known that the state had accepted the state registration. But put that to the side because that's for another day. It makes sense, if you think about it, if you're Maori Capital Management, to maintain your federal registration until you know that the state has accepted your request to be registered with the state. Because what happens if the state says no? It could. You know, it could go through the questionnaire because they actually have to fill out an elaborate questionnaire and they could decide, you know what, we don't want to register you. Okay? But they need to be registered. So they maintain, and I've talked with Fritz Memory about this, and I expect that he would tell you this, they, they maintain their federal registration, and ultimately they file the withdrawal, the ADVW, that now is Exhibit 1, on October the 11th, and they're no longer federal covered. Uh, but the bottom line is that Maori was not only registered with the state, but they were registered with the feds until October 11th, 2012 and neither registration is mutually exclusive. And I can guarantee you that if Maori did something that the feds, the SEC, thought was inappropriate while they were federally covered through October 11, 2012, they would go after Maori. Okay, so let's talk about what the states, they filed replies, and they have two points that they raise in the reply. The first is that the doctrine of judicial estoppel applies. And Your Honor, I had an associate spend a better part of the day looking for cases in the state of Texas as to whether or not judicial estoppel applies in a case like this. We could not find one case, nor has the state cited to any case where judicial estoppel applies in a case like this. You know, normally judicial estoppel, and, and sometimes judicial estoppel gets conflated with collateral estoppel and race judicata, I mean, judicial estoppel most of the time applies in one proceeding where you take a position in that proceeding and then later in the proceeding you take the opposite. But that's not always the case, but that's the way it comes up most of the time. But think about what the state's trying to do here. They're trying to say that a position that you may or may not have taken in a state regulatory manner, notwithstanding the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to put on his defense, that somehow you're stopped from taking a contrary position in a criminal case. I can tell you the state of Texas has never recognized that. There's not one case out there. But even if it did, it doesn't apply here. Because the, the, the statement that they say, the particular statement that the state says that we've taken an inconsistent position on, is finding a fact number three. MCM is located in Texas. 
is a registered investment advisor, and they keep on going down. On June 25, 2012, MCM transitioned back to state registration is currently registered as an investment advisor with the Securities Commission. You know, we don't dispute that. I mean, that absolutely is true. We are not, and we never dispute you know, just so that we know that the state is zeroed in on this statement in particular, I mean, they say, moreover, by entering into the disciplinary order with the TSSB, agreeing that this critical fact finding was true and correct, Paxton is now stopped from contending otherwise in this written application. So, you know, our response to it is kind of what I've told you here, is that we acknowledge that Mowry began the process of transitioning back to state registration when it filed its application sometime in the first half of 2012 and that the state ultimately accepted Mallory's application for registration on June 25th of 2012. That the state accepted the registration doesn't obviate the fact that Mallory was federally covered until October the 11th and that during Mallory's transition period it was duly registered with the Texas State Securities Board and the SEC. Again, even if judicial estoppel did apply in a criminal proceeding, Paxton is not taking inconsistent positions. Now, I've got some stuff here about judicial estoppel. You know, I, I, I actually cited to the most current case that I can find out of the U.S. Supreme Court that hasn't been cited in either of the briefs, but it does cite the case that the state cited to, which is New Hampshire versus Maine. Uh, you know, several factors have to be taken into account. First, a party's later position must be clearly inconsistent with its earlier position. And as the court can see, the position that we're taking here today is not clearly consistent. We agree they started transitioning back to state registration when the state accepted that registration, actually earlier, I mean, whenever they filed in the first half of 2012. But that transition didn't fully take place until they finally end their federal registration, which it made sense for them to keep until they knew that they had actually been registered with the state. Now, I told you that there were two reply points. There's only two that the state has in their reply. The next one is that whatever argument Paxton mounts about whether MCM was subject to state registration, notwithstanding his admission uh, before the TSSB that it was, challenges the sufficiency of the evidence, a claim he may not litigate in a pretrial rent. Well, I believe it's fairly, again, uncontroversial. Mowry was federally covered, that supposedly he's a representative of Mowry, a federally covered entity, and that that extended until October the 11th, 2012. There, there is no evidence to consider the sufficiency of. There's not a fact issue. There's no nothing. This is all, this is really your problem, Sean. Um, you know, we're not challenging the sufficiency of the evidence. I, we've cited one case here on briefs, but I've got a bunch of cases where the accused is entitled to a writ when there is no valid statute under which he can be charged. Ex parte, I don't even know how you to pronounce that. Again, there's a number of cases out there that say that a writ is appropriate in this particular situation. Now, we've, we've talked about how a writ should issue because he can't be charged with this statute because of the fact that he didn't have to register. He only had to notice file. If for some reason the state, the state gets up to argue that no, 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 notwithstanding that we haven't addressed it at all in our briefing, but he really did have to register. Again, they haven't argued that he didn't. They've only taken the position that judicial stuff applies. That if that's the case, Your Honor, then I mean, I would ask the state to show you where in the Texas Securities Act it says that he has to register. When it is clear, again, as the day is long, that if your federally covered representatives only need notice file, that's the only provision that's in there, is that when they are federally covered, they need only notice file. So if they get up here and they take the position that he had to register, then this statute is unconstitutionally vague because no one could ever figure that out. Not even the smartest securities lawyers can figure that out, let alone a reasonable person. So with that, Your Honor, I think that's all I've got on the first, so I'll sit down. So. Does the state have a response to the first? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Schaefer. This whole argument 
premise on dual registration, and, and it's sort of a lawyerly sleight of hand. It was a wonderful presentation, very clear and organized, but it leaves out the most important part, and that is that after June 28th, there was no dual registration. He's absolutely right that Dodd-Frank came along and changed the requirement from $25 million to $100 million. And essentially what the law said at that point was that if you have under $100 million, you can't be registered under the SEC. So we give you until June 28th to either transition to state government or just go out of business. Or I guess you could somehow raise the amount that is under management to over $100 million and continue with SEC registration. But now we couldn't do that. So what they did do is they started on the process of obtaining state registration. But it had to be completed by June 28th, because on June 28th, whether they withdrew or not, federal supervision, federal regulation was going to come to an end. That was the deadline that was set for all investment advisory firms, not just Maori. So they had until June 28th to obtain state registration, or that was it. They started on the process, and on June 25th, they did obtain state registration. Now, what we found out from talking to Mr. Patel, the State Securities Board, is they were required to withdraw by June 28th, which was the deadline that was set by the SEC, or by Dodd-Frank. But they didn't do that. Instead, they just left it hanging out there until October. Now, when they withdrew in October, that didn't mean that they had dual registration between June 28th and October, because legally they weren't entitled to dual registration. That was the whole reason why they had to go back to register with the state. So, what they did is they brought you a little bit of evidence by way of, don't, don't look at what we say, look at what the state says on, on this neat little PowerPoint you just saw. However, if you go back to the transcript, which is actually part of the writ, look at what Mr. Patel doesn't tell the Rangers. The Rangers didn't interview Mr. Patel in the transcript you saw. That was the Travis County District Attorney's Office that began the investigation and then passed it off to the DA here in Collin County and to us. Here's what Mr. Patel says to that investigator. Uh, June 25th, Mallory Capital Management became state registered again. And what happened is there was a change in the federal law, and now if you have $100 million, you have to or below, you have to be state registered. So they had to come back to registration. So that's why they came back to registration at that time. Because June, they came back June 25th. June 28th was the cutoff date. That was the day when you were no longer under federal supervision. And if you weren't under state supervision by that time, under state registration, you were done. You're under no supervision. You're operating illegally in whatever state you happen to be in. But as of June 25th, they got that registration completed and it was a done deal. But you can't keep, you can't play a shell game with the State Securities Board and the SEC. I'll follow the laws I want to follow, but I won't follow other laws. And I'll just hide behind the SEC or the State Securities Board. That's why in this case there is no dual registration. Dual registration would have ended at the time they went with the state. The fact that they filed notice later on doesn't even matter. That was something that, according to Mr. Patel, they were required to do by the 28th. They just failed to do it, and that does not give them protection by claiming they're dual, duly registered because under SEC law, they did not meet the qualifications for SEC registration after June, 20, after June 28th. The other part of that is this. You talked about judicial estoppel, and we did raise that as an issue. You know, Mr. Paxton hired, as you can see, a very proficient hiring lawyer. He has like 14 numbers sitting there. He hired one of the best securities guys in the state to go in back in April of 2014 and negotiate a deal with the state securities board. And that's what we talk about in our response. And what that had to do with was this. Mr. Paxton found out that a story was about to come out in the newspaper about his work with Bowery Capital and the fact that he was not registered at a time when he is uh, assisting in the sale of these securities and that he was receiving a commission. So he had his lawyer go meet with the state securities board and within what they tell us was record setting time within two weeks, they had hammered out an agreement and something that normally could take several months to a year. But they did. It was to pay a $1,000 penalty. 
and they agreed to terms within that, that uh, order, that agreed order, Mr. Paxton and his lawyer signed off on it, acknowledging the very conduct that you see here. He was required to register, he failed to register, he paid the fine. I'm sure that the argument is going to come up, well, he did that just to get it behind him so he could move on and run for office. But what better way to move on than to say publicly, I didn't do anything wrong. I was duly registered at the time. This is an argument that they've now come up with before the, for the first time. In fact, it's interesting, to looking back to the history of this case, to look at comments from just four or five months ago made by Mr. Matea to the Texas Lawyer magazine, there's a significant chance that he will be convicted if this case goes to trial because he did, after all, admit to violating securities law. It is a slam dunk case. Now Mr. Matea's position is, well, no, wait a minute, he was duly registered. Mr. Matea knows, and the law says, after June, 20, June 28th, there was no more SEC registration. So the vagueness argument that's the second part of their writ is just a total non-starter because unless there actually was dual registration at that time, it's a, it would be a total non-issue. It wasn't vague. It's very clear that as an investment advisor representative, if you're soliciting, you're engaged in a number of acts, then you must be registered in the state. He failed to do it. That's the response that we have to the first argument. Mr. Matei. Let me kind of take it in order here. The, with all due respect to Mr. Schaefer, he's got a phone. Okay. The, I agree with Mr. Schaefer to the extent that it was incumbent upon people under 100 million in assets under management to transition back to the state, and they had to do it by June 20th. Totally agree with that. Okay. But it doesn't change the fact that he's still federally registered. Okay. Now. The SEC, they very well could have revoked the registration if they wanted to, but they didn't, okay? And, and the way that the securities laws work is notwithstanding what Mr. Schaefer has told you, is it's not just automatic that somehow they're not federally covered. They are still federally covered, that, and that is black letter law, okay? He was federally covered, or at least Mallory was, until October the 11th of 2012 notwithstanding that it was incumbent upon Mallory to transition to state registration by that June 28th date, okay? So the only way that they would not be federally covered is if the SEC revoked them or they withdrew just like they did in ADVW. And again, I, I would ask the state to produce whatever proof they have, because I know it's not there, that somehow their federal registration lapses by virtue of that date, okay? Now, the SEC very well could have filed a revocation action, but they didn't, and they remained federally covered. Uh, the second point is, is that, let's just say that Mr. Schaefer is right, okay? That in fact, that date under Dodd-Frank was a date by which somehow the federal registration lapses. It's not, but let's just assume for our purposes that that's the case then, I mean, think about it. I want you to put yourself in the defendant's shoes, okay? Am I federally registered? Am I not? How do I figure out whether I'm federally registered? Do I have to dig through, not the Texas Securities Act, but go through the provisions of Dodd-Frank, the rules on implementation, to try to figure out whether I'm federally registered or not? The one thing that I do know is under Section 12.1 of the Texas Securities Act, is that if you have a federal registration in place, that you only have to notice on This statute is incredibly unconstitutionally vague. It's even more so for the grounds that we're going to talk about on the second application for red babies or this, okay? So let's just say that Mr. Schaefer's right, the statute is unconstitutionally vague, okay? The last point is, is that, is that there is no question uh, but that Mr. Paxson, that he was approached by the Texas State Securities Board in connection with the underlying regulatory matter, that in fact the disciplinary order was entered into um, by Mr. Paxton. You know, the truth is, is that everybody missed the fact that, I'm sorry. that everybody missed the fact that he continued to be federally covered during this time, that the ADVW did not get filed until October the 11th of 2012. I've talked to his lawyer. Okay? It's just something that people miss. Okay? Nobody 
ever raised it. I will tell you, when I was making comments to the Texas lawyer, I had no idea that he was federally covered. In fact, I found it out when Mr. Little, Mr. Little's been working with me, he's a great securities lawyer. He's like, Bill, he was federally covered during this entire time. There's a federal registration in place. 12-1, I mean, for people to do this kind of work, this is kind of exciting stuff, we go, wow, this is, this is a big moment because he was in fact. And again, I mean, if we want to talk about kind of the practicalities of things, again, think back to, I mean, there's no way that Mr. Paxson is going to know that somehow the state is accepting the registration on the next day when he refers the Henrys over to Mallory Capital. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So, that's my response basically to Mr. Schaefer is, is again that he's got to be formally revoked or there has to be withdrawal in order to not be federally covered. The, the statutes are constitutionally vague otherwise. And again, people just miss the fact that in fact Mallory Capital Management was federally covered on the day. Your co counsel chomping at the bit. <laughs> move on to the second week. Okay. Okay. So if things were not already muddy with regard to the Texas Securities Act, they're only going to get muddier now as we talk about things in connection with the second application of the Judge, we need to be monitored back up. your PowerPoints in this? There. Yeah, okay. So if the monitor's not working, we can follow along with hard copy. Okay, very good. And the truth is, Your Honor, I, I put these PowerPoints together. They're a little more wordy than I would normally do for a PowerPoint presentation. Usually I don't have quite as many slides. And, and you're going to shoot me here in a second because I've got about three or four slides that are really wordy. Okay. But, but I did it for a reason, Your Honor. And, and I did it because you got a lot of briefing here in this case. And I really wanted to distill, I want to make this as simple as possible, the arguments that we're trying to make. It really cuts to the core. And I would commend these PowerPoints to your review as you're actually going through this over the next week or so. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the second application for a habeas corpus. Quick summary here, just so we can keep all this in mind as we're going through it. We've already talked about Nismian, 1996. It preempted all past and future attempts by states to define this critical term, which is investment advisor representative. So it preempts all state attempts to define what I'll call also an IA okay. The proper definition that's been developed by the SEC is now codified at 17 CFR 275-203A. Texas has improperly attempted to impose its own definition of an IAR 
in Section 4P of the Texas Securities Act. Okay. So the definition of 4P is different than the SEC definition. And NISMIA says that the SEC reigns supreme. Nowhere in the Texas State Secur Securities Act is the correct federal definition identified. And as a result of Texas improperly trying to impose its own definition, and not putting the federal definition in the Texas Securities Act, that 29I is unconstitutionally vague because it's impossible for a person of ordinary intelligence to know what's prohibited. There's no way that a person can know that he or she is an investment advisor representative. And Rich should also show the issue. Remember how on the first Rich Your Honor, I kind of made two arguments. The first argument was is that it's a statute under which you can't be convicted, but we also argued unconstitutional vagueness. <coughs> Kind of doing the same thing in flip though. Here we're arguing because it is just so crazy and constitutionally vague. That's our principal argument. But also because he's not an investment advisor representative under the federal definition, it's not a statute under which he can be convicted, applying the federal definition of an IAR. Uh, and seemingly the state does not contest that the definition of an IAR has been preempted by federal law. At least I didn't see anything in the briefing. We'll touch on that here in a second. Okay, so 29I, we've already seen this, so I won't go back through it again, but that's the key statute at play here. We haven't gone through this. Okay. This is the definition of an investment advisor representative. Okay. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. Okay. I won't, let's not go through all the details of it right now, because the key thing for you to know is that this definition is going to be a different definition than the federal definition of an investment advisor representative. What it says really just doesn't matter, quite frankly, because it's the federal definition that preempts this definition. Okay, so NISMIA, I won't even begin to try to fully go through NISMIA because, like I mentioned earlier, it, it created a sea change in the securities world. It recognized that states were doing things differently amongst themselves, and basically Congress says, we've got to figure out one way to kind of handle the securities. At the time of NISMIA, there were over 23,000 different investment advisors. There were a number of states that had different ways of trying to regulate the investment advisors. We provided for SEC regulation of advisors with 25 million or more in assets under management. And they importantly provided for future SEC rulemaking, like the CFR that we're talking about here in just a second. Okay, so the SEC under NISMIA after NISMIA passes, it begins its rulemaking authority, and it issues SEC release IA-1633. <clears throat> this is the start of about three slides that are a little too wordy, and I apologize for that, but I think that all of this is important. These right here are in kind of the preamble, the, the preface, and I think it's important for the court to get kind of a flavor for what NISMIA and what the SEC is trying to do is it relates to amendments to the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. So let's just read this. The Commission is adopting rules and rule amendments to implement certain provisions of the Investment Advisors Supervision Coordination Act. So let's stop there. The Coordination Act is one act in, under the umbrella of this bill. Okay? The Coordination Act is trying to coordinate how we're going to deal with investment advisors. So we're going to be focused on the Coordination Act. Um, the, the rules and rule amendments define certain terms used in the Coordination Act, including investment advisor representative, the key thing in play here. Congress was also concerned with the cost imposed on investment advisors and their clients by overlapping, in some cases, duplicative regulation. In addition to the Commission, 46 states regulate activities of investment advisors under state investment advisor statutes. Consequently, many large advisors operating nationally have been subject to the different laws of many states. Industry participants strongly asserted that compliance with different state laws is imposed significant regulatory burdens. It gives you kind of a flavor for what we're trying to do. So now let's talk about, that's kind of the preface. Now, in SEC release IA 1633, we start zeroing in on the definition of investment advisor representative. <coughs> And the SEC says, there is no contemporaneous legislative history explaining what Congress meant by the term investment advisor representative in 203 AB1A. 
the definition of investment advisor represented very substantially from state to state. As a result, the incorporation of state law would conflict with one of the primary goals of the coordination act, which is to promote uniformity of regulation. And I'll just skip to the very bottom. If a state adopted a sufficiently broad definition of the term investment advisor represented, the coordination act would have no preemptive effect since all supervised persons would be subject to state licensing, registration, and qualification. So it's trying to get away from it, okay? It's gonna set up one definition of an investment advisor representative. This is the last really worrying slide, okay? The coordination does not, uh, let's just jump on here. Rather, the commission believes that Congress left the term investment advisor representative undefined with the expect expectation that the commission will use its rulemaking authority to define the term and at the bottom, only by adopting a uniform national definition of investment advisor representative in Congress in intent to delineate more clearly the securities law responsibilities of federal and state governments be achieved. So as a result of this, here is the rule, okay? Now, remember 4P, it was one of the very first slides we looked at. It was about seven, eight lines or so. I mean, you can just kind of look at it and you can see it as a substantially different definition, okay? I'm not going to go through all of it. Investment advisor representative means a supervised person who has more than five clients who are natural persons. More than 10% of his clients are natural persons. A supervised person, and this is very important, is not an investment advisor representative if the supervised person does not on a regular basis solicit, meet with, or otherwise communicate with clients of the investment advisor or provide personal investment advice. In addition, they actually have to have a place of business. And what's the definition of place of business? An office at which the investment advisor representative regularly provides investment advisory services, solicits, meets with, or otherwise communicates with the clients. I will tell you, Your Honor, there's just no way that the state would ever be able to prove that General Paxson is an investment advisor representative under the SEC's definition. That's not necessarily the issue so much for this particular writ here, but there is just no way. I mean, even the most that we've seen is that over a number of years, there were five individuals that he supposedly referred to Maori Capital Management. There were three that supposedly were an issue in connection with the state. That's certainly not right. He doesn't have a place of business either. I mean, he was, he was a lawyer at that time, and as we expect you'll hear, even with regard to the Henrys, he was providing legal advice, not investment advice. So, let's move from the rule. States have recognized that the feds preempted the definition of investment advisor representative. So, the North NASA is the North American Securities Administration or Administrators Association. It actually came up with two rules which recognize the federal preemption of the definition of investment advisor. One of the model rules forms the basis for widespread state recognition of federal preemption of the definition. 32 states have incorporated the federal definition, the one we just saw, into their definition of an IAR. Four states have no registration scheme, presumably because of federal preemption, but unfortunately not Texas. So, Texas, it's really odd. You can go through the Texas Securities Act, and again, there is not word one about the federal definition of investment advisor representative. But we actually did find, as we're kind of scouring through things, that in the frequently asked questions section that you can go to on the website to try to provide some, uh, some clarity for investment advisor representatives that they're actually, I mean, is a direct reference to SEC Rule 203A3A, okay, which is the rule that we just talked about. And it actually goes through the federal definition of an investment advisor representative. This is, that's in their frequently asked questions. Now, I can tell you that based upon the state's reply, that they have, I mean, they obviously saw this in our briefing, but they're arguing that 4P still applies. Okay. It's specifically set out, even though 
even the Texas State Securities Board, although it's not in the Texas Securities Act, in its FAQs is seemingly kind of adopting the federal preemption. You know, what I'm getting at, John, is that this is a quagmire. How can anybody figure this out? You go to the statute, it's not there. You go to the frequently asked questions, the right definition is there. It is absolutely a mess. So, because the definition of an IAR has been preempted, it's no longer valid. At the same time, the correct definition of an IAR is not found in the TSA, nor is it incorporated by reference. Not only can a person of ordinary intelligence not ascertain whether his or her actions violate the TSA, government authorities, let me just underline this again, even the Texas State Securities Board, I mean, they are essentially the regulatory agency over the Texas Securities Act. Okay, that act continues to exist. There have many attempts by it to abrogate 4P, and in fact, the FAQs talk about the federal definition. So government authorities lack guidance to correctly enforce the law. You know, 29 I already requires a person to understand how it interacts with Section 4P, 12, 12.1, like we talked about earlier. If it weren't vague enough on that basis alone, now we're telling people that they have got to go to the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, they've got to go to NISMIA, the subsequent rulemaking authority, and this inordinate complexity renders the statute unconstitutionally vague. And, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, well, uh, well, let me point this out too, okay? So the statute's also vague because it actually contains a definition of an investment advisor representing this misleading. I mean, think about it. It says that an investment advisor representative is X when it's really Y. I mean, that in and of itself could form the basis for the constitutional basis. We've already talked about the FAQs. You know, we, we noted this case, and this is in our brief, Your Honor, that the State Securities Act is highly penal in nature. It requires that it be strictly construed. A freedom act must come clearly within the prohibition of the statute. And any doubt as to whether an offense has been committed should be resolved in favor of the accused. So, this right here, remember how we, in the first writ, we argued that it's a statute that can't be used to convict and then on constitutional vagueness. On this one, we led with unconstitutional vagueness. But we also come back to the fact that it's a statute under which you can't be charged. I mean, the reason why is, is that the federal definition of an IAR <coughs> is not there. Because it's not there, they can't charge under the statute. It has to be there in order to charge under the statute. And it's apparent that the state is not using it. And I have a feeling, Your Honor, probably when, you know, we don't know what the PowerPoint said that Mr. Weiss showed the grand jury, but let's think about this, okay? If it showed that 4P was what the definition is, that's wrong. If they didn't take into account, let's go back to the first one. If they didn't take into account the fact that he was federally registered, and Section 12.1 says that if Mallory is federally registered, then you only have to notice one. I mean, I know I'm going back to an earlier motion, but it kind of dovetails into some of the things that we're talking about here right now. Um, and I'll tell you what, I would like to get some confirmation. I can't ask it, but I know you can, Your Honor. Ask the state whether it's prosecuting Paxton under the federal or the state definition. It sure appears to me that it's the state, because that's the reply. They only talk about 4P. They don't even dispute this notion of federal preemption. Or frankly, they can't, because it's a new law, preemptive law. So, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the state's reply. I mean, the first point they make is that Paxton voted for it. Well, so, okay. Yes, he voted for it. There are a lot of other legislators that voted for it, too. But you know what? The Fed's preempted. Okay. <clears throat> Paxton fails to acknowledge his extraordinary burden. Your Honor, based on what I've shown you, I mean, I understand it's a burden, but I'm not going to call it an extraordinary burden given what the law is. And the law is very clear. Paxton fails to cite any controlling legal authority to support his avant-garde preemption argument. I mean, the gist of this one is that this is such a novel avant-garde theory, and maybe I should take that as, as a compliment. 
But the truth is, is that it's not all that hard. It's relatively simple. You have in this PowerPoint presentation everything that you need to have in order to grant this rent. It is what it is. NISMIA preempts state law. Uh, and I think that may be it. So we'll sit down and see. State's response. Thank you, sir. Just so it's clear to Mr. Mateja, uh, this prosecution is under state law. The, the whole argument with two presupposes that there is still dual registration continuing through the date of the offense and on to, into October of 2012. But he's right in his assertion that we did say that Mr. Paxton was 429I before he was arrested. I'm going to talk about vagueness before we talk about the first part of the argument. It's somewhat ironic that Mr. Paxton is saying the statute is unconstitutionally vague because it is impossible for a person of ordinary intelligence to know what is prohibited, cannot know whether he or she is an investment advisor or representative. First thing about that is you can't tell if you read the statute, because it clearly sets out the definition. And secondly, he voted for the law. He got the bill. He studied the bill. He went to the Texas legislature and voted on the bill to make it a criminal law, because it was at a time, as Mr. Mendea said, when there was a lot of rampant fraud in the investment community. It was a time of Enron and, and many other cases that were occurring at the time. And it was a bill that was carried bipartisan in the Texas legislature because they knew they needed to criminalize conduct that investment advisors were engaged in that was taking money from innocent people. Mr. Paxton voted for that law. And that law that he passed, people have gone to prison over. People understood that law and went to trial. They got convicted. They're in prison. They're on probation. You know, I object to that, Your Honor, because I don't believe that is true. No, it is true. I've got a chart with 10 cases prosecuted not solely under 29I and another 30 or 40 where 29I was charged in combination with other cases. Well, that's not consistent with the information we got back from the Texas State Security Board pursuant to a TPI inquest. Uh, Once again, they got bad information. I've got the cases called numbers and counties and the sentences that people got based on the law that he passed that he is now saying he can't understand. It doesn't even make sense. Even a person of ordinary average intelligence can't make sense of the very statute that is imposed on others but not imposed on him. One law for him, one law for everybody else. That's the argument. There's nothing vague about it, Your Honor. The definition is clearly set out, but they're presupposing that federal preemption will apply. One of the things that was pointed out in the section release IA 1633 that, that was read to you, Congress intended to reduce these burdens by subjecting large advisors to a single regulatory program administered by the commission. It applies to large advisors, people or the companies that control over $100 billion in investor funds. That's not Mallory Capital. It used to be $25 million and they would have been categorized as one of the large uh, investment firms. But that changed. That was the whole reason they went back to state. And as Mr. Paxton knows, the state has a right to be under state law, to run the affairs of the state under state law. He's been suing the Obama administration for years, for last year apparently. Because we do have a right in Texas to pass laws, to enforce laws, and unless it is in conflict with the federal law in conduct, that involves both state and federal action, and that's not this case, state law is going to apply every time. The federal government can't come in and say, okay, the Texas State Securities Board has to adopt our definition, and they can't do that unless the person is duly registered. Dual registration ended when they became registered by the state and were no longer qualified to be, to be covered by the federal government after June 28th. That's a magic number. It was set by the end by the Congress that after that day, you are not under SEC control. You're under state supervision, or you're just out of business, or you're operating outside of the law. It's a magic day that was set by the government to give notice to these firms, this is the day you are no longer under SEC control.
fact that they didn't withdraw their name until later is of no significance because they were under state registration solely after that date. So the whole first part of this argument assumes preemption. It assumes dual registration, but there was no dual registration. There's nothing unconstitutional about this law. And, you know, it, again, it goes to a mistake of fact offense. If they want to put this on as a defense, then Mr. Paxton thought he was operating under federal law at the time. That's fine. But this man was under state registration and then under federal registration and then back to state registration. And when you want to play on that playground, you have to know the rules. If you want to be an investment advisor, you have to know the state rules and the federal rules. And when you're no longer, no longer under federal registration, you've got to go back to playing by the state rules. That's how every other person prosecuted under that statute has been held, and he needs to be held with the same accountability. Mr. Mattei. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, the first point he made was is that his reply hinges on this notion of the, the dual registration and the fact that supposedly he was now with the state registered at the time. This argument has nothing to do with dual registration. It has to do with preemption. And, and Your Honor, I will tell you that even state registered investment advisors, investment advisors representatives that never were federal registered, okay, that the correct definition to apply is the definition that the feds have imposed on all the states. Okay. The state of Texas cannot, and, and quite frankly, they've not argued this at all. I mean, there are a lot of these things, Your Honor, they haven't put in any of the reply briefs. This is the first time we're hearing these arguments from them. I would have spent more time giving you some great authority for this, but the bottom line is, is that because he state registered, this the investment advisor representative definition that's in the federal SEC rulemaking authority, that's the definition that applies. I mean, Mr. Schaefer's got to even recognize that in the state's FAQs, they put the federal definition. Why do they put the federal definition? Because they believe the federal definition applies, notwithstanding that they continue to maintain Section 4P of the Texas Securities Act. So, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Schaefer, he does not understand securities law. He does not understand that even state registered, that have never been federal registered, it's the IAR definition that is the federal definition, okay? This has nothing to do with this notion of dual registration. It has everything to do with the feds came in and preempted this. I mean, the court knows. There's lots of areas that the feds have done preemption, and, and it's all appropriate. I mean, I, I don't know how the prosecutors would somehow want to try to declare Nismia unconstitutional because it somehow inappropriate or violated the Tenth Amendment rights of the states. I mean, that argument is not out there. It probably has been raised. It's probably been shot down many times. So they can't argue that because that's just not the case. Nismia is the rule of the land. The federal definition applies. Um, yeah, and the advisor size, I, I don't know where Mr. Schaefer gets that, but it, it, the, the advisor size has nothing to do with it. Uh, I mean, I think he's trying to conflate that somehow because if you're really big that you're going to stay under federal registration. Well, if you're under federal registration, the definition of an IAR is going to be the same as if you were a state registered because NISMIA preempted it. There is one definition for an investment advisor representative in the United States, regardless of whether it's Hawaii, Texas, New York, or otherwise. Some states have sawn fit to go ahead and incorporate it because they want their citizenry to know that that's the definition. Unfortunately, Texas hasn't seen fit to abrogate for me, but at least they put something in their FAQs. But again, it just makes the entire scheme hopelessly complex, inordinately hard to understand, and unconstitutionally vague. Mr. Schaefer, any further response? I don't respond, okay. Mr. Mattei, are you ready to present a fourth writ? You know, the fourth writ, Your Honor, we are going to let it stand on pleadings. Okay. Any objections to that on behalf of the state? Yeah. Okay. So submit writ number four on the pleadings only. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. As I understand it, too, just on, we took judicial notice of all the exhibits or the attachments to the various writs and the motions for both sides. Yes. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Can I come up here? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
confirm that I'm correct. I do not have a speaking role in this on my new or significant issue. May I step outside a little? Yes, sir, Mr. Cogdell. Any time. Years old as, <laughs> as we all are. So this is so this is the motion for failure to give adequate notice in connection with the failure to register. Okay. Give me just a minute to find out. Okay, I have it. So, Your Honor, I will tell you, to kind of lead off on this, that General Paxton feels vindicated in connection with this motion because two of the three bases that we seek relief to quash, at least in our view, the state is basically conceded the point. They filed a motion for leave to amend on two of the three points that we make here, which is all the reason why we believe, Your Honor, they realize that they messed up, they want to do over, and the court should go ahead and quash the indictment for at least the two reasons, if not all three of the reasons that we'll spell, spell out here. Okay, so the indictment in this case, here's the operative language that Warren Kenneth Paxson, on or about the 18th day of July, 2012, did then and there knowingly and intentionally render services as an investment advisor representative. The key language that we want to focus on is render services as an investment advisor representative. The key thing to point out here just initially is, is that what we're talking about here is an act. It is the manner and the means by which you actually violate the statute by rendering services. Much like if you were to drive a car while you're intoxicated. It's not the state of intoxication that somehow is the act. It's the driving of the car that constitutes the violation. And that's important because we're going to see it based on some of the case law in a second. So we've already looked at 29I. This is the statute, again, that we would, <laughs> we would urge or to grant our writ on. You don't even have to get to these motions, quite frankly, if you grant writs one and or two. Uh, we've already talked about 4P, the definition of the advisor, the investment advisor representative. I didn't get into the details of it before, because all really the court needed to know was it was substantially different than the federal definition. But now I need to talk about some of the specifics. Remember how the statute talks about rendering services so if you're an IAR, you are an IAR because you do something to solicit clients for the investment advisor or who on behalf of an investment advisor provides investment advice directly or through sub-agents. Okay. So the way that you would render services to potentially be in violation of the statute as alleged in the indictment is to either solicit clients or to advise clients. Again, we're focused on the act. What is the actus reus of the alleged crime? The indictment provides inadequate notice because General Paxton has not been put on notice of the manner and means by which he violated 29. Did he supposedly violate the solicitation problem? or the investment advice problem. There is a significant difference between the two, and we'll talk about that. Now, one of the seminal cases is a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals case, the Barbernell case. The Barbernell case is a DWI case. Um, that's why I talk about intoxication, just to kind of set the framework. But let's just take a look at some of the specific language that Barbernell uses. Quote, if the prohibited conduct is statutorily defined to include more than one manner or means of commission, the state must, upon timely request, allege the particular manner or means it seeks to establish. The court acknowledges that generally when a statutory term or element is defined by the statute, the charging instrument does not need to allege the definition of the term or element. But, quote, 
in some cases a charging instrument that tracks the statutory language may be insufficient to provide a defendant with adequate notice. This is so when the statutory language fails to be completely descriptive. So 29I only talks about rendering services, right? Okay. The statutory language is not completely descriptive when the statutes define a term in such a way as to create several means of committing an offense. And the definition specifically concerns an act or omission on the part of the defendant. So in our case, we need to figure out whether or not they're arguing with General Paxton soliciting or was he advising? Because the act is the rendering of services. There are multiple means by which you can render services and we need to know that. So you're saying render services, you want a manner and means? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're basically left to guess. You know, the reason why this is important, Your Honor, I mean, there's some real import. This isn't just us saying, you know, let's just quash for the sake of quashing. If the state elects the advising prong, we believe that General Paxton will be such, subject to an exception to liability under the Texas Occupation Code and the Texas Administration Code with regard, I mean, the only advising that we know of that he did was in connection to him being a lawyer. I mean, he was to him his lawyer. They ask him for a referral. He refers them to capital management, and that's it. Okay. Uh, no evidence that Paxton advised the Henrys on financial matters. Again, it's important for us to know whether he's supposedly advising or whether he's soliciting. If the state elects the solicitation prong, there's no evidence that Paxton actually solicited the Henrys. Especially, I mean, the state actually references in another portion of the briefing on another motion that the, the definition of soliciting in connection with the Baratree statute. Uh, and it talks about when neither the person receiving the communication nor anyone acting on that person's behalf has requested the communication. This is the only place we know of where solicitation is supposedly actually uh, defined. The definition also excludes communications initiated by a family member or by a professional who has a prior or existing professional client relationship with the person receiving the communication. So I'll just, I'll posit this question. What if the state only puts on evidence of solicitation? Paxton is acquitted, and the state subsequently indicts Paxton based on Paxton's alleged advice. I mean, we need to know, we need to be able to put on notice of what is being charged and what is barred for subsequent prosecution. Beyond what I've already mentioned, the reasons why it would be important for us to know. Um, now, the next point, so let's move from, we need to know now, that's point number one. Okay. Point number two, there's only three points, is that he is entitled to notice of the investment advisor that he supposedly represented. Now, Your Honor, I mean, it's not a secret here. I, I think all of us believe that Maori Capital Management is the investment advisor that supposedly he represented him. We understand that, we get that, okay? But the mere fact that they have, I mean, they still have to tell us that. They actually have to tell us that in the indictment itself. You know, I'm just gonna give you a, a couple hypotheticals here. What if Pax referred the Henrys to two IAs? Was compensated by both, because that's what the statute would require. One of them was registered with state, and one of them was registered with the SEC, okay? And you might think, well, is, could that ever happen? Well, what if the two IAs worked in the same office or under different registrations? What if the two IAs specialized in different investment products? What if Paxton merely referred to Henry's to one and provided investment advice in combination with referral in connection with the other? What if the state put on proof regarding one IA, Paxton was acquitted, and the state subsequently indicted Paxton for the referral to the other? Again, we're not contesting the fact that they have given us discovery about Maori Capital Management, have any reason to believe that there's another investment advisor that he's supposedly represented, but that doesn't obviate the fact that we are entitled to know, and these are all the reasons why we're entitled to know this. Without knowing the IA's identity, Paxson cannot fully and properly investigate or challenge the existence of the duty to register. Again, 12-1, did they have to register, did they register with the state? They have to register, if they were with the feds, they only have to know this one. Okay, so that's the second point. Let's move to the third point. And something that we haven't focused on for a really, really long time, 
but it was literally the third slide that you looked at while I was standing up here. It was 29I and the provision that talks about as required by this act. So you can't violate 29I by merely failing to register. You can only violate it when you didn't register <coughs> as required by this act. Those words are very important. We'll see here, if you actually look at the indictment, the failure to register count. that there is no mention of that provision as required under the Act. There's no mention of it. Here's the wording from the, the figure register count. It's pretty easy to fix it. I mean, I've given kind of a possible revised version here, but there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. But it is an element. It is an element of what the state has to prove as required by the Texas Securities Act. So the indictment does not clearly track, I'm just citing from the state's reply, they say they clearly track the applicable statute, we say they do not. It wholly fails to allege that he was not registered as required by this act. It's a statutory element of the offense, which the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt. By omitting it, the state improperly shifts the burden onto us to prove that he was not required to register. Again, failing to register as an IAR is not a crime. It's only when you fail to register in the TSA required registration that it is a crime. In the Code of Criminal Procedure, everything should be stated in an indictment which is necessary to be proved. There is no exception to the substance of an indictment except that it does not appear therefrom that an offense against the law was committed by the defendant. Your Honor, I think that's all I've got on that portion. Those are my three points. Okay. Mr. Weiss? Yes, sir. May it please the Court. Yes, sir. <laughs> With all due respect, notwithstanding that great PowerPoint presentation that we just saw and that compelling argument, it's much ado about nothing because the state has, in fact, filed a motion to amend this indictment. And whether Mr. Mateja wants to call it a do-over, the legislature and the Code of Criminal Procedure call it a motion to amend. And while I know the Court has given them 10 days to respond, there's not a lot they can say because the statute itself that authorizes amendments doesn't give them a voice. They don't have the right to object because the state has the absolute right, 10 days outside of trial, to amend an indictment as to form or substance so long as it does not allege a new or different offense. Everything that they have asked for in their motion to quash in that great PowerPoint presentation, we've given them. It's easy to fix, and we fixed it. And if they want to claim, as part of their, these special prosecutors and their financial windfall that we're going to talk about in a little bit, or morons, you're not going to hurt our feelings. Because we have the same statutory duty not to convict but to do justice that 2.01 of the code imposes upon us. And that's what this does. Everything else that we just heard is white noise. Everything else that Mr. Mateja just talked about, without regard to whether it's remedied in this motion to amend, and in fact it is, all of his hypotheticals on that one wordy PowerPoint slide, what if, suppose that, are evidentiary issues that he can raise on Mr. Paxson's behalf at trial to 12 folks in that box. But we didn't hear about State v. Rosenbaum for a very good reason, for a criminal appeals decision authored by a man who I had the privilege of talking to before, Sam Houston Quinn, that says you cannot challenge the sufficiency of the evidence in a pretrial motion to quash. You can't, because those are trial issues for trial court juries. Beyond that, if in fact one of those evidentiary issues that we just talked about, whether or not Mr. Paxson is entitled to an exemption as a lawyer who merely referred clients down the hall to Fritz Mowry, what about this, Your Honor? If it was a referral, if Mr. Schaefer comes to me and says, I've got money that I wanted to track, that I want to invest, who do you know? And I said, I'm not off the lovely and talented Nicole DeBoer. That's fine. But if I 
take a referral fee. That's a horse of a different color. It's interesting they didn't manage to mention that. It was just a simple, I'm a lawyer, go on down the hall, let's refer him to financial wizard. Excuse me for an hour. At the end of the day, everything that they've asked for, we give them. Whether it's a do-over or a motion to amend, everything that they want, we give them. Why? Because that's what our duty imposes upon us. And that's what the legislature has given us the right to do with the amendment provision of the code of procedure. Mr. Mate. Yes, Your Honor. They are asking for a do-over. And I do think that Mr. Wise correctly cites the law, as I understand it. I think the court knows I do a lot more work in federal court than I do in state court. Uh, I do a lot of securities work, and I don't want to apologize. I'm not trying to accuse anybody of being wrong. So I just there are people that do securities work, and a lot of this stuff is not all on card. It's stuff that is very well known. And but I will tell you one thing that you know I noticed in, in Mr. Weiss's pleading yesterday in connection with the motion to leave to file an amended indictment is the fact that you can't you don't have an absolute right if it's a new or additional offense. I don't remember the exact provision, 2010 or something like that. So let's let's go back to the rendering of services, the soliciting advising. If you're General Paxson and you're just looking at things, you have no idea actually what the offense is. You don't know whether it's because he supposedly solicited or whether or not he advised. And the truth is, is probably the grand jury never heard evidence of one or both.